Good morning, everyone. So it is just a couple minutes after 10 o'clock. So we will just give it a minute um, and let uh, all of our wonderful participants log into the webinar. So thank you for joining us for Impact Tuesdays. I am Jennifer Krishka, CEO of the Jewish Women's Foundation of the Greater Palm Beaches. Uh, we are a social change foundation based in uh, West Palm Beach, and um, we are a funder. We provide education and advocacy events in the community. We have a professionals network that helps support women um, professionals, and we also run two leadership development programs, uh, one for teens and one for young women. So I am very happy to be joined by several wonderful women um, from the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness. So we will have a presentation this morning, as you can see on your screen. Uh, and we also will have a Q&A session um, towards the end of the webinar. For anyone who would like to submit a question, um, please do so by uh, going to the bottom of your screen. You'll see there is a Q&A icon. So you would click on that and you could submit your questions and then we will do our best to get to all of the questions that we received today. So thank you again for being here. Um, I can see that people are still uh, logging in. Okay, so for the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lisa Morano, who is the donor relations manager for the Alliance. Um, so Lisa's gonna go ahead and take over and I will uh, pop off screen for the meanwhile. Um, and I will come back on towards the end for the Q and A. Thank you right. so much, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Lisa Moreno. I'm the Donor Relations Manager with the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you all this morning about our newly funded program brought to us um, thanks to the support of the Jewish Women's Foundation. It's going to impact a lot of folks here in Palm Beach County, so we're really excited to, to tell you about it. Um, but before I hand it over to my colleagues, I did just want to share with all of the Jewish Women's Foundation folks how grateful we are and and what a small world it is. Um, so when we applied for this grant a few months ago, of course, we didn't know who else was applying for the grant. Um, and then when it was announced who were recipients of the grant, I was so excited and honored and humbled to be a recipient alongside my mother, Val Stanley, who works for the Laura's Place. They'll be doing their Impact Tuesday next week with JWF. And um, it's funny because the reason I got involved in advocacy is because when I was a young child, my mom was the executive director at Pace Center for Girls of the Palm Beaches um, under the leadership of Dr. Lawanda Rivora, who was on the Impact Thursday, Impact Tuesday last week. So it's so neat to be able to see the far reaching impact that JWF is making throughout the state internationally. Um, yeah, so I'm so excited to be a part of that change that's being made. So now I'd like to introduce you to my two colleagues, Joanna Candell, the founder and CEO of the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness, and Liz Mata, LMHC, our Director of Education and Resources. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and I echo Lisa's sentiment in thanking the, the Jewish Women's Foundation for their support, their generosity, and most of all, for just being fierce leaders um, in, um, in our realm and just being so supportive of, of women and young girls. Um, so just a little bit about me, and then I will have my amazing colleague share a few words about her. Um, so I founded the Alliance after a 10-year um, struggle with my eating disorder. I've been recovered for the last 21 years. I do use the word recovered because even though I do talk about eating disorders a lot, it's no longer my own struggle. And I used my experience to give back and to make a difference. Um, and I'm very proud of the organization um, that we are able to really create conversations and smash stigma about topics that are typically not, not discussed. Um, Liz, do you wanna share a, a few words about you? Yeah, definitely. So my name's Liz Mata. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida, um, born and raised in Palm Beach County. 
and received my master's of mental health counseling at the University of Miami. Um, spent some time working at a residential eating disorder treatment center for women in um, South Miami, where you know I really saw um, and learned firsthand um, the impact of eating disorders and the impact that trauma can have on young adult women um, and you know women of all ages. Um, move back to Palm Beach County because that's definitely where my heart is and was so grateful to be able to reconnect um, with the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness where I had earlier on um, volunteered um, and was able to join the team um, and now to be in a position of Director of Education and Resources has, has been pretty exciting and, and phenomenal. So really happy to be here today and again really grateful um, to, to JWF. Awesome. Um, yeah. Is there anything more you want to share, Joanna, before we get into it? Yeah, so just a few things that I just want to bring up about, about um, today's presentation and a little bit more about the organization. Um, I do want to share that sensitive and difficult subjects will be discussed, um, you know, including gender-based violence, disordered eating, mental health, and substance use. We just caution our attendees to be very mindful. Um, and if at any point the conversations um, are too intense, we just ask you to self-care and be aware. Um, but we always like to just share with a little disclaimer at the beginning. Um, so before we talk about eating disorders, I would love to share a little bit more about the Alliance for those of you who this is your first time learning about the organization. So we are a national nonprofit that is dedicated to the outreach, education, early intervention, support, and advocacy for all eating disorders. Um, even though we are a national organization, our hearts are in South Florida. I think the thing that makes um, it's so beautiful is that Liz, Lisa, and I are all from West Palm. We were all born and raised in the West Palm Beach area, which I think makes us an anomaly and, and makes mm -hmm. this so much more important for us to really make a difference here. So, so many of our programs are really rooted in our community, in this community. Um, so the organization really functions in three different um, pillars, if you will. First and foremost, we offer education to our frontline responders. So nurses, dentists, um, doctors, um, teachers, guidance counselors, um, therapists, dietitians. Because unfortunately, only 20% of all healthcare providers are giving are given any education on eating disorders whatsoever. When you when you look at teachers and guidance counselors, it's less than 10%. So we really really aim to educate individuals to recognize and refer um, eating disorders. The next pillar is our referral pillar. So we, ref we, we do referrals to all levels of care from outpatient all the way up to acute medical stabilization, which we will talk about a little bit more in our presentation. The last pillar is our support pillar. So we believe in the clinician-led free support group model. So we currently have 20 free clinician-led support groups that are happening ac across the country. Five are here in West Palm with an additional one in Miami, some in Tampa, some in Orlando, Manhattan, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, Austin, Texas, um, Philadelphia, and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, with new ones opening in Newark, Delaware, and in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We also have our psych services program here in, in West Palm, where we are the first of its kind in the country, where we offer very low cost outpatient care to individuals that are underinsured or uninsured. The one thing that, that you will learn about eating disorders is that they do not discriminate. They don't choose. They are not disorders of choice. They are biopsychosocial illnesses. And unfortunately, those that are most vulnerable do not get access to care. So through our psych services program, we offer very low cost, anywhere from $25 being the highest to $5 being the lowest, $50 sessions with two psychologists. We are very, very thrilled to be offering this program that we opened its doors to in September of 2007. And since then, we have treated 102 unduplicated patients. So moving on to um, why we really do the work that, that we do is we're really rooted in making a positive impact in our local communities by challenging systems and institutions that may increase the risk for developing an eating disorder, especially amongst our marginalized population. 
And what you will learn today is that there is such a high correlation between gender-based violence and eating disorders. After all, we view eating disorders as maladaptive coping mechanisms. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Liz, to share more about eating disorders. Thanks, Joanna. Um, just to present some you know, really important statistics to everyone, Every 62 minutes, at least one person is dying as a direct result from their eating disorder, which might be a very startling statistic for some of you to hear. I know for me, the first time that you know, I was able to take this in, um, it really stuck with me um, you know, within a, a one hour time frame, someone's losing their battle. And I think it really hits home because this disease, eating disorders, have, you know, historically, there are so many misconceptions. Um, and I think Joanna mentioned, you know, it might have been thought to some as a disease of choice, um, you know, something of vanity. Someone chooses to, uh, you know, maybe manipulate what they're eating, manipulate their body because they're unhappy and, and therefore they have an eating disorder when this statistic very much shows that that's not the case. Um, if, if every hour, essentially, someone is losing their battle um, and dying from their eating disorder. At least 30 million Americans will experience an eating disorder in their lifetime. Um, and that's 700,000 in the state of Florida. So that's about one in 10 individuals. Again, so that's not something that someone um, is waking up one morning and, and deciding, you know what, I think, I think I'm going to have an eating disorder. I think that I'm going to, you know, stop eating certain things or start eating more of certain things. Um, it's very much a widespread epidemic for less, lack of a better way of putting it. Um, that's, that's affecting one in 10 individuals. In recent years, it's important to know that the occurrence of eating disorders has really grown by leaps and bounds. Eating disorders are more common than autism and Alzheimer's disease, more deadly than prostate and melanoma cancer, and even more costly than depression and anxiety. So when we take a look, and this graph really shows it well, when we take a look at some of the data out there, um, the funding that goes into what we receive for research toward eating disorders, and we take a look at some of the other illnesses and the funding that they are receiving, you can see that eating disorders are incredibly underfunded. Given the prevalence, it's pretty astounding. So we know that 30 million Americans will struggle with an eating disorder, and we know that we see here that for schizophrenia, for instance, there's 3.5 million individuals who are, are struggling. And yet look at the disparities among those that, uh, among who's receiving, you know, what amount of funding. So we're receiving about $32 million a year, whereas schizophrenia receives toward funding around $243 million a year. And that's not to say, of course, you know, every illness is important and it needs funding toward research. Um, but again, it, it takes a, a deeper look at, you know, the, the lack of weight that is put on such a severe illness that is causing and taking the lives of so many Americans. Um, that's also to say that some of the research that we have is quite dated. Um, so sometimes we have no choice but to reference something that um, was researched in the early 2000s. So again, it's really just taking a, a, bigger, pic a bigger look at the, the overall picture of, of where we stand. Eating disorders are the second most lethal psychiatric illness with suicide as the primary cause of death. Um, so for a very long time, eating disorders were actually had the highest mortality rate um, it's now second to opioid addiction. And we do know that 25 to 33% of those with specifically anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa have attempted suicide. I think if you really take a further look at it, you know, individuals with eating disorders are using their eating disorder as a, a maladaptive way of coping. 
something is going on in their life that they have not learned the proper tools um, to really be able to properly, or I shouldn't say properly, but healthfully cope with whatever is going on. And so this can be a form of, of helping them get through those times. Um, and if we take a look, um, individuals with anorexia are 18 times more likely to die by suicide. For bulimia nervosa, seven times more likely to die by suicide. So these numbers are, are startling and, and they're quite drastically higher than what we'll see with the general population. There are also strong correlations between gender-based violence and other forms of self-harm for those with eating disorders. So again, you know, someone with an eating disorder might be coping with the violence that they've either witnessed or experienced um, through the behaviors that they're using with food. Um, and when we talk about it in terms of self-harm, um, you know, in some ways eating disorders and the behaviors used with eating disorders are forms of self-harm. You're, you know, the individual is choosing to restrict, to starve their bodies um, of the, the fuel, the nutrition, and the energy that they need, or they're choosing to purge through self-induced vomiting. So, um, or they're choosing to overindulge, to numb out through, you know, an, an overindulgence of food. Um, so in many ways, this is their way of coping and it and can definitely be viewed as a form of self-harm. And Joanna mentioned this in the beginning that eating disorders are not choices. They're serious and life-threatening biopsychosocial illnesses. And what we mean by that is that there is a biological component to eating disorders. There is a genetic predisposition to the development of eating disorders, but that alone is not going to determine who develops an eating disorder. There is also psychological and environmental impacts that come into play. And like we have here, it really creates the perfect storm where you have that genetic predisposition, you have those psychological, um, environmental factors that kind of all come together and create what then becomes an eating disorder. So I know Joanna um, Candel is very open and, and about her history with her eating disorder and which very much sparked the creation of our organization. Um, wanted to share just her perspective on, on what this means. Sure, um, thanks Liz. So you know, when, when we talk about the perfect storm, we talk about, you know, like everything come together, like just to create, you know, this, this outcome. Um, and the best way that I can describe it is by sharing a little bit about um, my history um, and really giving some insight into what that perfect storm actually looks like. Um, so in terms of genetics, so um, my, I really have to go back um, to, to my parents. Um, my father is actually a Holocaust survivor. Um, he was in France, uh, born 1937, um, was definitely in the ghetto, um, narrowly escaped with his life. His father perished in Auschwitz. Um, so my father actually, um, my father's experience had definitely some significant impact on my perfect storm. And what I mean by that is, is that there's definitely evidence of transgenerational trauma. Um, there's a lot of literature, a lot of research out there that takes a look at transgenerational trauma and the development of eating disorders, as well as specifically specifically looking at children and grandchildren, even great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors and their development of eating disorders, as well as substance use disorders. So that was definitely one part of the perfect storm. Um, my dad has one sister. Um, she actually struggled with anorexia nervosa in her life. Um, I actually didn't know that she had had an eating disorder. Um, I just thought that she had a very strange relationship with food. Um, my mother um, was born in um, Northern Africa, in Algeria, migrated to Paris at the age of seven, um, one of seven children, three brothers, three sisters. Two out of her three sisters actually had eating disorders as well. Again, one of those things where I wasn't, I didn't know that they had eating disorders 
disorders um, until much later in my life. The only reason why I share that is because I want to make it very clear that this was not a learned behavior. It's not that I saw my family members engage in eating disorder behaviors and therefore I learned. This is just really purely to show that genetics really does load that proverbial gun. In fact, we believe that if a parent or a sibling of a parent has had an eating disorder, you have a 12 times more likely chance to develop an eating disorder yourself. So as far as genetics goes, I like to say I was basically screwed, but just like Liz will, will share, is that genetics doesn't necessarily mean outcome. It just means that you're gen genetically predisposed. However, I did have the other factors that, that Liz talked about. So I've struggled with anxiety for as long as I can remember. I don't actually remember living without anxiety. For me, as, as it presented as a child, as I was very shy, I used to hide behind my mom's legs. I would peek my head out. Um, I also never felt good enough. I always felt like I could be doing better. I was a perfectionist, or I should say, I will own it. I am a perfectionist to, the, to a T. Um, as long as I can remember, I only view things in two ways, either black or white, all or nothing. Um, my mom always said that she doesn't call me a type A personality. She calls me a type triple A personality. Um, and I know that for a lot of you guys listening, this might ring true for individuals who you know that have experienced eating disorders. So I had that those that that temperament. I had the co-occurrence of that, you know, depression. And well, first it was anxiety, and then it morphed into into depression. I had the genetics. And then for me, my sort of environmental trigger pull is that I was also a ballet dancer. I started dancing when I was three years old, um, which actually just hit me for the first time that I have a three-year-old daughter right now. And it's just really come full circle for me. Um, and my mom took me for, to my first ballet class and I knew that I wanted to dance more than anything in that moment. Um, I became very, um, very intensely involved in it. I was dancing many times a week. I used to spend my summers in New York um, at School of American Ballet. Um, and for me, when I was 11 and a half, um, I was in a class of girls that were a little bit older than me. And the artistic director of the company came in and said that we had this amazing opportunity um, to audition to dance next to the corps de ballet in the Nutcracker. Um, and the only caveat was we had to lose weight before the audition. And now I know that they were not talking to me. I mean, I was very young, I was prepubescent, I was very small. But when you have that all or nothing personality or mentality and you want to win at all costs and you want to like, succeed at all costs, you do what you gotta do. And being 11 and a half years old, I had no idea about weight loss. So I remember telling my mom um, when she picked me up from ballet class that night is that I was going to go on a healthy food diet. I was gonna eat fruits and vegetables. And as a parent, especially of a parent right now of a child who will not eat a single vegetable, when your child says, I'm gonna eat a vegetable, you celebrate, you embrace it. You want your child to eat whole foods. You want them to eat all foods, right? Definitely fruits and vegetables. And I have to say that that was really my trigger pull is I really embodied that the term, the path to hell is filled with good intentions is I wanted to better myself. I wanted to get the role. And for me, a simple diet, because I went under my body set point, the genetics fired and a little diet for me turned into an almost 10 year battle with a very almost lethal eating disorder. So I hope that that gives a little bit of perspective into the perfect storm. Thanks, Liz. Thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing your story. And I, I think it, I know for so many, it can help really come full circle, you know, what the development of an eating disorder looks like and how everything can be perfectly lined up, especially having those genetic predispositions and then the environmental factors that really lead into you know, an eating disorder. And, you know, I know Joanna is very open in sharing her story that, you know, she, she did struggle for, for a, a decade, um, you know, trying to get the proper treatment. Um, and I think, and I, she can probably speak to this more um, later on that it was very challenging because there weren't a lot of providers who understood eating disorders. Um, there weren't, you know, individuals who were in the Palm Beach County area specifically who were able to identify and give her the proper diagnosis. So it, it led to going from 
thinking there was a solution um, in one place to being misdiagnosed and the eating disorder continuing and morphing um, over a 10 year period of time. So I mentioned that just because it very much ties into why we're so dedicated to wanting to educate um, our providers locally. Liz, before you move on, sorry to interrupt, uh, we do have a question from the attendees. Someone was asking, can you please define what you mean by eating disorders? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I guess to get more specific, eating disorders can look, you know, very different. Um, there's many different kinds of eating disorders, um, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, but again, they, they are um, mental illnesses, so they do derive from um, this a biological component, but they look very different in how they present. So it really is an individual's way of, again, you know, coping with something going on in their life. Um, so we have, you know, and the, I'd say some of the more commonly known eating disorders are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, um, a newer one, which, which has come out within the last decade, um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So there are really behaviors around food. Um, so manipulations of how one is either restricting the food that, that they consume, um, possibly going through periods of um, restricting and then binging, so consuming a large amount of food in a, in a short period of time, um, possibly then purging that food by self-induced vomiting or through compulsive exercise or through laxative use. Um, and so again, it is a way um, for that individual to cope. Um, it's a maladaptive coping mechanism that helps them really move through life. Um, and that's why there is such a strong correlation again, and, and we'll speak to this further um, with those who have experienced gender-based violence, who have experienced um, you know, various forms of trauma. Um, you know, individuals might use their eating disorder as a way to disconnect, to dissociate, um, to detach from reality, depending on what they've been through. Um, I don't know, Joanna, Lisa, if there was anything you wanted to add to that. No, I think the only thing that I would add is that they're, you know, eating disorders are maladaptive coping mechanisms. And I know that Liz and I have both shared that. And um, I, I think that, you know, a, a big question is, is where does disordered eating end and eating disorder starts? And that's what the qu question that we get quite a bit is, I think that a lot of us um, can say that we've had interesting relationships with food, right? Um, and that stems really back to the beginning. I don't know about you guys, but I have vivid, uh, vivid memories of when, you know, I first learned how to ride a bike and I fell off the bike and I scraped my knees and my mom came over, cleaned my knee up and gave me a cookie. And she said, here, sweetheart, this is going to make your, your knee feel better. So if a cookie makes your scraped knee feel better, what does a box of cookies do to anxiety, depression, loneliness? Um, you know, so I think that a lot of us have this um, could be bordering on unhealthy relationship with food or, you know, some like we're on that proverbial diet wheel a lot. Um, but the true definition of where the line ends between disordered eating and eating disorders is where you can no longer effectively cope and do life, meaning that it impedes your everyday functioning, if you will. Um, I will tell you, when I was in the midst of my eating disorder, it was the first thing I thought about every morning and the last thing I thought about every night. It was at the dining room table and it was at the decision-making table. Um, I didn't do life. It was my, in a sense, my get out of life free card where I became so numb from misusing food, either restricting food and then at the end of my, my eating disorder, binging on food to numb, to stuff, to escape. Um, so I think that that's really where the line is. Um, and we can definitely in the Q&A part, talk about it if anybody has specific questions. But I think Liz, you gave a beautiful overview and then just knowing where that line is between like disordered eating and, and eating disorders. Great, thank you, Joanna. So another important thing to um, you know, understand is that eating disorders really do affect all individuals, um, individuals of all genders, ages, races, ethnicities, body shapes, and weights. 
sexual orientations and socioeconomic statuses. Um, they do not discriminate. And eating disorders historically have definitely been portrayed in one light in the media specifically as very much affecting only young, you know, adolescent females. Um, and while someone who fits that description might struggle with an eating disorder, we just don't know by looking at someone, whether they're healthy, whether they're unhealthy, whether they have an eating disorder, whether they do not have an eating disorder. Um, and I think that can be really hard for, especially for you know, providers who are treating and assessing individuals um, to be able to ask the same questions, um, do the same assessments when they're working with a young adolescent female, um, as opposed to when they're meeting with a 45 year old male. Um, eating disorders do, and we see that all the time in our psychological services outpatient clinic in West Palm Beach, um, that eating disorders are affecting across all cultures and across all genders and across all ages. Um, so we do have individuals who are coming for services in, you know, later stages of life, um, individuals who are in midlife and individuals who, who are younger, but a lot of the education that we do um, to primary care providers, um, you know, and medical providers across the board is that, you know, when you're assessing, it's really important to be assessing all individuals who are presenting in front of you for eating disorders, not just someone that we might, um, you know, assume could be more predisposed to developing one because they really do not discriminate. Um, risk factors such as trauma and violence can definitely increase a person's likelihood of developing an eating disorder. Um, and that kind of just ties into what Joanna and I have already mentioned in the fact that someone who's maybe experienced gender-based violence, who's experienced or witnessed any kind of physical sexual violence um, are possibly and, and probably grasping for ways to cope with life at that point. Um, you know, if they don't have supportive factors in their life, supportive and protective factors in their life, um, then how are they supposed to cope? How are they supposed to move forward in their career, in new relationships they're forming? Um, so again, if that genetic predisposition is there, um, that's how that eating disorder can easily sneak in and start serving as a way for that individual to, to cope. Um, to get by. Um, so using food, abusing food, um, you know, manipulating one's body as a way of coping. So uh, to speak about eating disorders in children um, is always very, I think, difficult um, because, you know, over time we have definitely seen an increase in the amount of young children who are affected by eating disorders, um, who are affected by, um, you know, just things that they're seeing in the media, um, social media definitely, and how it influences their, their perspective of their bodies and, and who they are. So we do know that clients under 10 years old account for 10% of eating disorder clients in treatment. And then from 1999 to 2009, so through that 10 year period, there was actually a 72% increase in hospitalizations of children for eating disorders under the age of 12. We also know that nearly half of three to six year old girls reported that they worry about being fat. So, I mean, that's three years old. Um, and I think that while it can be shocking, I think if we reflect on you know, the society that we're in um, and a lot of the messaging that we receive, um, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the obesity education that goes on in, in the schools, um, there definitely is, it's rooted in good intention. Um, we want what's best for our children. And like Joanna was saying, you know, if, if you hear your child saying, you know, I really want to eat fruits and vegetables, um, of course, we're going to be excited about that. Um, but it's also how they're internalizing those messages. So when you tell a child that they need to 
eat healthier and they need to move their bodies more, um, they might, it's possible to experience a lot of shame, especially if it's a child in a larger size body, um, that something is wrong with them, that they aren't worthy of love or they aren't worthy of existing as they are. Um, and they need to do, do something to change that. So a lot of the, um, you know, obesity education that goes on in the school system can very much exacerbate um, negative body image. Um, it can lower self-esteem. And for those who are predisposed, it can definitely start creating that perfect storm into the development of an eating disorder. Women and girls are disproportionately affected by eating disorders and account for 76% of cases of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. So again, while we know that eating disorders do not discriminate and we definitely have our men and our boys who are struggling, women and girls are definitely um, being affected in, in great vast ways. So in a sample study of girls aged 10 to 15 years old, those who had experienced violence of any kind had higher rates of weight dissatisfaction, purging and dieting behaviors, eating significantly less when upset, desiring a thinner body, displaying perfectionistic tendencies. Um, and there are definitely other contributing factors that play into this. Um, you know, society's obsession with thinness, bullying, um, and not only, I mean, bullying has definitely been something that has been around for quite a while, but I think the, the cyberbullying and the anonymity behind a computer screen, behind a cell phone, um, provides those who want to target um, vulnerable individuals with, with greater ways to, to really impact those who are struggling. So, and this might be a surprise for some of you, but women in midlife are actually one of the fastest growing rates of eating disorders. Um, so there's definitely triggers um, that play into that. Um, desires for women to remain young. So I think when we really think about um, how society very much frowns upon physical signs of aging for women, um, you know, when we look at magazines, um, when we look at the media, and there's images of women um, who are in their 60s and their 70s, and the comments are all about, wow, she's 60 and she looks like she's 40. Um, or when we think about Jennifer Lopez at the Super Bowl this year, um, all the comments were very much directed on, she's 50 and she looks so good, she looks so young still. So there are very, very much um, pressure to remain looking useful um, for women who, who are aging. I'm not gonna go through each of these, but I think that we can all just you know, take a moment to think and recognize how different stressors that women in midlife experience can be that trigger. Um, divorce, menopause, um, loss, they're all very huge. Um, eating disorders that were not treated years prior, definitely. I mean, eating disorders have such stigma. And uh, I think, you know, recognizing that, you know, 20 years ago, it might not have been as acceptable to receive help. I think it's still very challenging. There's definitely an issue with access to care, um, but at least those options are becoming more available. Um, due to a matter of time, I'm gonna try to get through these slides, um, but we definitely are gonna have some time for question and answer at the end. So women who have experienced gender-based violence and eating disorders are also more likely to have co-occurring psychiatric illnesses including PTSD, borderline personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder. And eating disorders are really the tip of the iceberg, which I think is really important to know. Um, and we have reiterated this in other ways. Um, we know that the eating disorder um, is what we might see, you know, when we are first, or when a provider is first meeting with someone that's struggling with an eating disorder, we're seeing that they are manipulating um, behaviors with food, they're manipulating their bodies, but the real treatment and really what's going on is going to be underneath. So it's going to be the, the domestic abuse that they've been experiencing for years, um, or, you know, the sexual abuse that they experienced during childhood, 
or the depression or the anxiety um, or you know the the divorce that they've witnessed their parents going through. Um, so that's really where the core um, issue is and really where the treatment begins and ends in, in really helping those with eating disorders. Um, so I did kind of already mention this, that they do, you know, eating disorders don't exist alone. There's always going to be something that's existing alongside it. Um, and it, it very much um, plays into the eating disorder, you know, as they're, you know, helping them, helping that individual cope and go through life. Um, eating disorders are often going undiagnosed and un, untreated, however, um, because, you know, for many reasons, if a provider isn't directly asking an individual um, if they've experienced an eating disorder, and not only that, if they're not asking very specific questions um, uh, pertaining to the eating disorder, that individual is likely not going to disclose that that's something that's going on for them. One, because it's the one thing in their life that they might feel like they have control over. And two, because of the shame and then the stigma that really surrounds eating disorders. So they might go into their provider's office and talk about, you know, the anxiety, their depression. Um, they might even talk about the alcohol use um, that they're, you know, abusing, but unless someone's directly asking them, they're likely not going to disclose that they have an eating disorder, which very much plays into the reason why we go and do so much education to providers to really make sure that they're including that in their assessments. Less than one in three individuals experiencing an eating disorder receives adequate care. Um, and this may be due to, uh, you know, lack of provider expertise, high treatment costs, I mean, insurance is definitely a major issue and they aren't able to access specialized care because of that. And at least 50% of individuals living with eating disorders abuse alcohol and, and or drugs at a rate five times the general population. Um, so, uh, you know, substance use is especially prevalent among those who have survived domestic violence, rape and other gender-based violence, which again goes into that, you know, being able to go through life, having experienced some of these very traumatic um, situations by, you know, numbing out, um, by, you know, self-medicating through alcohol, through drugs, through eating disorders. Individuals who have experienced gender-based violence and trauma have higher rates of eating disorders than the general population. And it's really, again, and I think we've reiterated this a lot, it's, it's that individual's way of coping. Um, and it's going to look different for every person. So for someone, and the big T in the middle is, is the trauma experience. So for some individuals, it's, you know, coping through abusing drugs, abusing substances. Um, for some, it's going to be, you know, through different behaviors around food. Um, and it, again, depending on this person's history, depending on their experience, depending on the world that they're living in, um, it's going to vary to how they cope. And, and also it might be multiple methods of coping. Um, it might be all of these things. It might be one of these things. Um, but it's important that our providers are taking a look at that. So eating disorders often serve as maladaptive ways of coping in very specific ways. Um, you know, for someone who is engaging in restricting behaviors, this might be a way for them to be really just numbing out. Um, so, uh, you know, getting to a point where they feel hunger um, and push through those hunger pangs and get to a place where they're just numb and very much detaching from their reality. Um, you know, the purging behavior, so specifically when we speak of, you know, self-induced vomiting, really and literally getting rid of an unwanted feeling and unwanted memory, um, you know, especially for those who, uh, you know, have a experienced trauma for someone um, to really be able to get rid of that feeling. Um, and then the binging behavior, being able to fill, fill a void. So someone who's very much overindulging in food um, and binging on, on a specific food item or, you know, binging on multiple food items. I know that we are, you know, already have only 15 minutes left. Um, we have so much more that we want to cover with you guys, but um, we can get to a point where we are asking questions as well. 
Um, I don't know if Lisa and Joe, you want to jump on? Yeah, Liz, if you could progress to the screen that talks about what the grant is covering. Um, so Joanna could just really quickly explain that before we get into questions. And we're happy to share this slide. If anyone's interested in learning more about the connections between eating disorders and trauma, we're happy to share um, the statistics in this slide with you. But Joanna, really quickly, if she could just explain the connections and what the grant will be doing, then we can hop into some questions. Absolutely. Um, so our goal with this, and I think one of the things that that Liz really did a, a beautiful job at describing is just the fact that so often people go undiagnosed because so many providers are not getting access to the education, um, which is why we're actually doing a lot of stuff within like medical schools and nursing schools. However, what we're so excited about this grant is that we're going to be doing trainings within providers, offices, school systems, agencies, and giving them education on how to recognize and refer. So giving them access to early detection, early intervention tools, being able to have screening questions, being able to look at what we're looking for, what we're asking them, um, talking about like what tools are going to be most helpful in the identification process, and then giving them the opportunity to give them referral information. So Liz, if you want to just go to um, the next page, you can just see who we're targeting. We're looking at physicians, nurses, hospitals, treatment centers, you name it. Basically, our philosophy is here is if you'll listen to us, we will educate you because we believe that no matter where we're gonna go, individuals that are experiencing eating disorders and, and gender-based violence are going to appear. And when we do education, we don't just do the physician, we don't just do the nurse. We like to have everybody in there because we never know where intervention can happen, whether it's going to be the schedule, whether it's gonna be the person who's doing utilization review. For us, it makes the most sense to do a really comprehensive and organic presentation. So we're educating all lines of intervention. Um, if you go to um, the next one, um, you know what our real goal is, is to give, give these, these first responders, if you will, the um, equip them with how to recognize signs and symptoms and again most likely refer them um, to to treatment and we do want to just say this is that we don't expect after an hour and a half presentation or a two hour presentation however long they give us opportunity to speak that they are specialists in the treatment of eating disorders one of the core the core pillars at our organization is connecting individuals to care which is why um, we've spent over the last 10 years um, really building the most robust and comprehensive referral database system in the country so we actually have um, a website that's totally different than our Alliance website. It's very accessible where you can search by levels of care, insurance that, that you have, what kind of co-occurrence do you have, and trauma is actually one of the most searched co-occurrences with eating disorders, which makes this program just even so much more important and impactful. Um, but people can go on and say, you know, I have Aetna insurance, I have anorexia nervosa, I have a co-occurrence of trauma, and it'll put either the clinicians or the treatment centers as well as people can definitely call us. Um, Liz is our you know, director of education and resources, and she literally spends days on end with families and individuals connecting them to care because we know that on average individuals from the time that they start to when they are gonna get help is five years. And when you look at the level of, of, you know, of mortality with eating disorders, we really need to be intervening sooner. We really need to be interjecting sooner. So that's why it's been so important for us to not only create an education component, but to also create a referral component. Because so often when, when we talk to dentists, for example, who are very educated about eating disorders, which is very interesting, they, they know what to look for, what they'll say to us is, number one, we don't know how to talk to our patient about it. And number two is, if we identify it, we don't know where to send them. So that's why this program is very targeted at education and referrals as well, because we really need to close the gap and say, this is what we're seeing and this is where you can go. So, and just to finish, um, the goals with the program is we hope to educate at least 200 um, community stakeholders within the two-year grant cycle. Um, and we hope that 90% of trainees will report an increase in knowledge. Um, something that we're also going to add to this is we're also going to ask a question, how much education have you received prior to this presentation? Because what we're, what we're very, what we believe, what we hypothesize is that 
a majority of people have not been getting have not been given access to care uh, to access to education excuse me um, when it comes to eating disorders um, so we just want to remind our attendees that full recovery from eating disorders is possible um, early detention and intervention is imperative this this grant is no doubt going to give us the opportunity to really like close the gap and really educate people not only on eating disorders but its connection to gender-based violence so um jennifer we'll turn it back over to you for questions um and answer any questions that, that you have thank you thank you for such a um informative presentation um liz and thank you just for all of the work that you're doing um we're really happy to be partnering with you on this particular project um i think that every single person knows someone um, who has struggled with either an eating disorder or disordered eating, um, or you know, they themselves have struggled with it. Um, so I, I think that you know, this issue is so important because it's so pervasive and also something that um, does go undetected or there isn't enough education. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. You. Um, I definitely do have some questions. I have many questions actually. <laughs> Um, so the first question I wanted to ask was if you could um, just tell us um, some of the services that you provide to your clients and then how you have adapted, um, you know, with the coronavirus situation. Liz, do you want me to start and then turn it over to you? Totally. Okay. Um, so typically in a non-COVID-19 world, um, we absolutely, you know, offer our, our 20 free clinician-led support groups across the country. We're doing a lot of referrals to care for all levels of care. Um, everything that, that we talked about, like our psychological services, which is really the heart and soul, like my heart and soul, I would say, because ever since I started the organization, the one thing that was so important to me was the one in three calls or actually the, the two and three calls um, that we get for individuals that do not get access to care. And so for many, many years that weighed very heavily on my heart because um, I ask favors from a lot of my, my clinician friends, but you can only ask so many favors. Um, and so I was very grateful that um, our clinical director, um, Dr. Joanne Hendelman, who is just brilliant and amazing, um, was right on board with us, with me, I should say, when I wanted to start psychological services and offer this first time in the country program where we offer very low cost eating disorder specific care. And Dr. Hendelman um, has such a love for training the next generation. So it was a beautiful like combination of training our future clinicians and offering a service to individuals that fall through the cracks. And like we talked about so often in the presentation is nobody chose to have an eating disorder. Treatment should not be a luxury. It's a necessity. People cannot recover from their eating disorder without access to care, just how people cannot recover from cancer without access to care. Um, so how we've, we've um, shifted during um, the epidemic is we were very um, early in, um, and I think that that was just um, a testament to our clinical director and our whole team to say, we're not gonna be able to meet in person very soon. So we very quickly shifted to online platforms. So um, all of our, so we actually hold three free clinician led support groups. It's actually led by, by me and we have clinicians on. At first it was me and Dr. Hendelman who was there for safety reasons because we can't regulate who attends the group since we were crossing state lines. Um, but now that HIPAA has relaxed the, the rules, we have um, clinicians that are joining us from across the country. Um, we do three one and a half hour check-ins, two for individuals that are experiencing eating disorders and one for friends and family. Um, we're offering a whole lot of Facebook lives and Instagram lives weekly. Um, we are meeting our, our community where they're at because um, as we talked about before we hopped on this, this, this presentation, is our community is extremely vulnerable. And I will tell you what we're hearing at the Alliance is that individuals are not doing well. They're, they're not, they're, they're not um, doing well in the recovery. I think the communal anxiety, the communal unknown, when you bring it into someone who, who experiences anxiety and depression now doesn't have access to their, their, their treatment team in the same modality, um, that they don't have their supports in the same way. Um, the feelings of isolation, being at home with maybe a lot of food can be very triggering, not having access to the food um, that they typically can have. Um, feeling completely out of control and then going back to the eating disorder as their modality of feeling that that control. Um, so we really brought it to a virtual platform. 
Psych Services has actually completely rotated virtual as well. So our two postdoctoral fellows are seeing their clients um, virtually. And I will tell you, I don't think they've ever worked so hard. They're not only seeing more clients, but they're also doing more supervision hours and supporting their clients. Um, Liz, do you want to shift how we've talked to how we sh even shifted our presentation model too? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, in, in addition to everything that Joanna's saying, we're also, you know, um, offering presentations virtually. So we've historically never done that because we love the ability to go out into the community um, and, you know, meet with people face to face. Um, but we're now being able to offer our presentations virtually um, to really anyone who's able to and equipped to um, set up a virtual platform for us. Um, so, you know, you know, we, you know, right now are scheduling some presentations with the Lord's Place, which we're really excited about, um, you know, and doing, you know, really any presentations that anyone is wanting to schedule. Great. Um, and in the Lord's Place is actually uh, going to be on our webinar next week. So, <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, it's great to see that so many of the organizations that we fund and that we work with um, also work with one another mm -hmm. um, because so many of these issues are interconnected. So I, I think that's really great. And Jennifer, if I could, that that's just something that I want to touch on is that I think under Joanna's leadership at the organization, we do consider ourselves feminist change makers. And we're really looking at the intersectionality of issues that are happening in our in our county. We know that, for example, the women who are at the Lord's Place who have previously experienced homelessness have a very high rate of domestic violence and gender-based violence. Therefore, we know that they are more likely to experience eating disorders because the t statistics tell us that. And anecdotally, we know that. Um, you know, not to break HIPAA or any confidentiality, but a lot, a lot of our clients that use our services do use services of other community-based organizations. The folks that we service that have eating disorders also are experiencing food insecurity. 70% um, of our clients earn less than 25,000 a year as a household. So we, we do see a lot of the same people going and using our services, using the food banks. Um, so it's really important for us that we work on institutional change, that we get to the root of the problem and not just a Band-Aid. So not only are we helping people cope with their eating disorder and find recovery, through this grant, we're also going to be training the physicians, the nurses, social workers, the people who are going to be able to really help these folks heal. Um, holistically. So we're really looking at institutional change here and making a bigger social impact so that it's it's not just about fixing the eating disorder, mental illness, it's about addressing the other issues as well. Yes, absolutely, which is of course, you know, critical to our mission because we are looking to have long-term social change for women and girls um, and not just to help them get through today, but to prevent these issues if we can and to get them long-term help. Um, so that they can be, you know, safe and successful. Um, so we are coming up on 11. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up um, today's webinar. So thank you so much, Liz, Joanna, and Lisa for being with us and, and sharing your um, knowledge and telling us more about the organization and the project. Um, you can see everyone on the screen. If you would like more information um, to contact anyone at the Alliance, the website is up. Um, also, there's social information and the phone number. Um, if you uh, have uh, more questions or you want to get information for someone else, um, here are um, all of the different ways that you can do that. Um, so thank you for uh, all of our um, attendees. So thank you for being with us today on Impact Tuesday. Uh, next week, uh, we have the Lord's Place, um, and actually that webinar will be at 1 p.m., um, so a little bit later than we have been doing. Um, if you are interested in learning more about JWF, um, please go to our website at jwfpalmbeach.org. Um, just as a reminder, as I always do, JWF is 100% supported by individual donors. Um, and so we really need those donations, especially now, so that we can continue with our education work, like these webinars, and also supporting these other wonderful organizations in the community. 
Um, if you would like to watch uh, this recording again or any of our previous webinars for Impact Tuesdays, um, you can find them on our website, again, at jwfpalmbeach.org. So thank you again to everyone for being here and our panelists. Um, please stay safe and healthy, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.